Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FanFest where we celebrate 20 years of EVE Online. 20 years, such a long time for an MMO or for any video game to exist continuously, really. My name is CCP Aporia. I'm a principal programmer on the Platform Technology Group, and I'm here to talk about how we undertake maintenance projects on our code base, how we future-proof our code base in order to keep the game running for another 10, 100, or 1,000 years. Who knows, right? E forever. <laughs> and I'm here today with my colleague, CCP Queen Bee. Thank you, yeah, hi. Hello, great to see you, and I'm so happy to be here. Actually, I've been with CCP more or less since 2007, but I haven't had a chance to attend FanFest for various reasons since 2015. So uh, when thinking back when I realized this, it's just crazy. So I'm very, very excited to be here today and happy for this chance to tell you about what we're doing. Um, I'm a software engineer and I've been in various uh, engineering and management roles at CCP over the years. And my current role is technical manager, which allows me to do both uh, management and programming. Uh, I absolutely re enjoy a lot writing code I also enjoy a lot, sometimes even more, deleting code. <laughs> and you'll hear more about that later. Yeah, <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is our goal, like CCP Apuria mentioned, like E forever, right? Um, and towards that end, we work on various projects for years and even decades. And we uh, maintain, operate, and actively develop code that can be up to and sometimes even over 20 years old. So what sort of implications does that have for the engineers? Uh, what sort of challenges does it present? Well, one challenge, which I like to think of as keeping the kitchen clean. And just this is really quite similar to when you're working in the kitchen. You know you should, you know, put things away, keep it tidy as you go. It's a lot more enjoyable, faster and easier to work in a clean kitchen. And yeah, that's not always how it is. Or I don't know about you guys, but my kitchen at least sometimes gets like really messy. And why is that? Well, it's just not always practical. If you think about it, if you were to wash every single like little knife or spoon or whatever and put it away as we were working still, things would start to take a long time. And sometimes we just have a lot going on. We're cooking a, you know, we have a big dinner party and the guests are coming and things are cooking in five different pots and pans. And then the guests have arrived, the food is ready, we put it out and we close the door on the mess. And we have a lovely evening, a lot of fun. Wake up the next morning, you have a choice. Do you spend time tidying up or do you just, you know, grab a bowl of cereal, take it to the living room and close the door on the mess again? And you can keep this up for some time, you know. You can just live on cereal and, and maybe toast for a while. And now, if you were going to, and this is not a very realistic scenario, but let's say you were going to just move out of the house, just abandon it, and you didn't care one bit how you left it, then you probably wouldn't even bother. But if you're going to live in that house and work in that kitchen for years, you're going to have to tackle that mess one day or eventually. And working in code that is heavily uh, burdened with technical debt, it does sometimes feel like this. And what happens is, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this and can relate. You start to like, make clean a tiny little spaces to work in and you try not to touch too much because you know and not make any sudden moves because things might just start to topple over you know as an analogy i just want to say it's not of course entirely accurate and not fair either because it gives the impression that the developers who made the mess you know they were just being lazy or sloppy or whatever and generally this is not the case um, usually people are working given a certain set of constraints there's almost always time constraints. Um, there's uh, backwards compatibility to deal with. There's the, uh, just the tech that is available at the time, frameworks that you have to work with. You have maybe, you know, you work based on the knowledge that you have at the time. I'm sure those of you who are developers know the feeling when you're done with a project, you know exactly how you would do it if you would, you know, start over. So it's all these things. Generally, people are really doing their best, and it's 
very easy to judge when you look at the old code. But you have to look back with kindness because in my experience, what almost, and I think all developers really want most of all is just to write beautiful code. That's what we're all trying to do. Um, but even if we had nothing but beautiful, perfect code that did everything we wanted, we still have another challenge. And that is that the world is constantly changing around us. And like, if you just look back, if you think about it, 20 years ago, the technology at the time and the changes since then, it's just, it's mind blowing really. Um, and I came across this image and I don't know like how much of it you can see. Um, it sort of goes through a little bit the evolution in devices and programming languages here and operating systems, all the things. This, this is just one small piece of it. This doesn't even begin to cover uh, cloud systems, software as a service, infrastructure as code, all these things. And this is, uh, so we have to keep evolving and adapting and we could probably spend our time doing nothing but that. Uh, and falling back to the kitchen analogy, that would be a little bit like changing the countertops every week. And we couldn't be, you know, cooking anything because the kitchen is under constant state of renovation. And again, we're eating nothing but cereal and toast. So um, it's a balancing act. When do we uh, make do with what we already have and works? And when is it time to uh, spend time adapting to new tech, possibly even rewriting or replacing entire components. And with that, I'm going to give it back over to CCP Aporia. Thank you, Queen Bee. So as you can see, a lot of things have changed. And as Queen Bee just mentioned, adapting to various technologies or environmental changes that happen in this time is always a careful balancing act. And the first step when approaching a new project to adapt to the changing realities is to effectively take a look at the uh, history. The pointer isn't working. Can you use the mouse, please? <laughs> this is the reason why we have to do maintenance work on technology <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that these things happen less regularly. So while we're waiting for the computer to uh, come back to life, um, as we said, the first thing that we always do when we have to tackle new updates and changing environments is that we take a look at the history. In this specific case, unfortunately you can't see the slide, but we decided to upgrade our Python interpreter version that we're running. Basically, EVE Online since 2009 has been running on a version of Python 2.7, a version of Stackless Python 2.7. And some of you may or may not know, but in 2009 it was also already announced that 2.7 would be the last Python 2 version, that the future would be Python 3, and that, you know, in a few years, no more support for Python 2 would be happening. That point in time actually happened three and a half years ago. So we are effectively left with the choice of maintaining Python 2 ourselves or to, you know, move it, move our technology into the future and adapt to Python 3 which was a really big change in the ecosystem for some of you that may know it. Um, so to tackle this project, we need to look at the history of Python usage at CCP. It is a very crucial part of our technology stack. Very early on in development, CCP had realized that using Python allowed for a very quick development speed. It's a very expressive language. It's really quick to get things rolling with it. Uh, some of you may be aware of, of Python and use it in daily life. So if you just open a command line or a shell and type in the Python command, you get an interpreter, you type in a small instruction and it just instantly executes, right? You get really quick feedback, that's really great. It's a quick iteration cycle and that just means you get to try out the IDs faster, you develop faster. The other part was that Python as a very expressive language 
also allowed non-programmers to contribute to the development efforts. Yes, we are there. Thank you. So th this low entry barrier enabled game designers to write up a little effect that they needed, to have technical artists write up a little animation that they needed. And overall, you know, for a company that's about to roll out a game, that's a really great benefit to have because time to market is money in the bank. As a consequence, for a long time, CCP was very, very deeply involved in the Python ecosystem. CCP was a sponsor on many PyCon conference instances. We contributed a lot to CPython and Stackless Python. And we even employed two of the core maintainers of Stackless Python for several years at the company. Last but not least, we were the company that ported Python to the PlayStation 3. That is quite the impressive technical feat. Um, the PlayStation 3 had 256 megabytes of memory. The phone you're holding there, that has more than 256 <laughs> megabytes of memory. <laughs> and the Python interpreter itself, without loading any code, without loading any modules of the standard library, is by default 25 megabytes of memory. So we had only 200 megabytes, roughly, to fit in all the textures, game assets, data files, and the actual game logic, right? So in short, we were quite involved. We pulled off quite many magic things with Python, but, you know, we need to keep using it because of that, and you know, we needed <laughs> reasons to upgrade because this is a situation we were in, right? We have all, this, all these features in the game and a good foundation, but there's this tiny, really important pillar that's Python 2.7, and that's slowly crumbling away. So, as I mentioned previously while we were waiting for the computer to come back to life, um, Python 2 was officially end of life January 2020. This kind of prompted us to the reality that we have to adapt. When we hire new people, <laughs> they usually don't have a lot of experience with Python 2. That's okay, you know, the world is using Python 3 for the most part. And, you know, we're using stackless Python as well, so that's another complication in the, in the book. Um, one thing we then realized as we were developing the native Mac client recently is that porting Python 2 projects to new hardware like the Apple Silicon chip is not quite straightforward. Python 2 has no concept of that. You know, they don't know there's an ARM64 that runs macOS. So we actually had to spend quite some resources to get Eve running on that hardware as well with Python 2. Overall, the Python ecosystem has moved on. You know, this ties a little bit in with new hires not knowing Python 2, but this is also a lot of libraries that we are using, a lot of packages from the Python ecosystem that we are using and that we also have contributed back to. Well, they are slowly leaving Python 2 behind or have left Python 2 behind. This makes certain upgrades for us really difficult because we need to be very careful about the version of the package we can use. And if it's, let's say, a networking package and there's a security issue with it, you know, that can get quite cumbersome. And another thing as well is because Python 3 is a lot more modern on many fronts, it allows us to get rid of some of the customizations that we had to do to stack with Python 2.7. I mean, there are, there are minor things like Unicode support, right? I mean, who wants to play in Korea or Japan or Russia, right? No, this is important. And we had to go to very great lengths in Python 2.7 to actually support us properly. In Python 3, that's a lot better and easier. Another thing is memory allocation routines that doesn't require us to cut deeply into it. There's a nice interface for just specifying the functions to use. And so we can just, you know, benefit from some changes in Python 3. That's a great list of, of reasons to upgrade. And with that, we started to come up with something called pre-production, where we want to figure out how can we do this update. You know, we really want to, we have good reasons, but how can we do it? It's such a fundamental piece of our technology. Uh, basically, everything depends on it. The graphics engine, there's a lot of Python underneath the hood. Audio engine, lots of Python underneath the hood. Network stack, that's all in Python as well to some degree. You know, it's very crucial that we approach this carefully. So during pre-production, we want to answer a few questions. We want to formulate a few questions as well, like, 
If we do this upgrade, can we simply drop in Python 3? You know, go to the python.org website, download Python 3, drop it in the SDK folder, compile. Will that work? Well, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not that easy. Yeah. But uh, you know, that was quite obvious to answer. But the next one was then, can we mix and match Python 2 and 3? Python 2 comes with a future module that allows you to import certain future behavior. You know, the Python guy is always doing some magic, like anti-gravity, but in this case, future. So you can write a certain import statement at the beginning of your Python script, and that turns the Python script into behaving like as if it would be running under Python 3, but almost, but very close. And, you know, can we maybe make benefit of that? Then, last but not least, do we know the full extent of the work that is required? Like, there is 20 years of history, a lot of time that has passed, a lot of code that has been written, and, you know, people that have been working on it have moved on to other projects, other companies, or other positions. <laughs> and um, the version of Stackless Python we are using is heavily customized. Do we know all the customizations? 99% of them are probably annotated, or 98%. I ran the numbers once when I was looking into it, but. Uh, you know, not all of the customizations are annotated. So, overall, it's a very, very complex situation and it requires us to do a lot of investigation of, of how we can actually really go through with the work that we have to do. And this investigation sometimes gets surprising results. On that slide, you can see two main lines. The large one, the top one, is the, the Python code lines. The lower two ones are C++ code. Um, and you may be able to see it, but here is roughly the time when Python 2.7 was announced as deprecated. And since then, we have basically quadrupled the amount of Python code we have in our code base. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Makes this job easier, right? So we, we made some interesting discoveries like this, and that just meant the whole work just gets a little bit more complex. But because basically everything hinges on it, and we need to do it, we need to be very careful. So with a complex, huge problem like this, what do you do? The same thing that evolution has always done, and that humans also have practiced very successfully for a few thousand years. When faced with a huge problem, divide and conquer. We came up with three distinct tracks in which we want to split this work. The first one is the stackless Python interpreter itself. Like, our 2.7 version is heavily customized. How many of these customizations do we need to keep? And also, how can we make sure that these customizations that we do have are not getting in the way of future updates like they just did with the, three, with the version 3 update right now? So we had to come up with a solution for that. The second stage is then, you have just seen the 4 million lines of Python code that we have. Um, how can we get those translated over? Can we just do them wholesale to Python 3 right away? Well, probably, but it's not necessarily the smartest idea because a lot of the game logic lives in, Python th uh, in the Python scripts, so any mistake in there can have disastrous consequences. So maybe there's a way for us to be a bit more um, conservative and a bit less risky in that approach. The last one is then migrating our C++ components that we have to Python 3 and well, that is unfortunately a track where we had to do everything. But with these three tracks identified individually, we could limit the risk and the scope of this project as much as we can. This is good in the sense that it also allows us to fail early. Like if we can't get the stackless Python interpreter up and running properly with our constraints, you know, then we may as well just say, okay, we cannot update to Python 3, we need to find other ways of dealing with Python 2 in the future. And discovering these sorts of failures early in such a project is really important because the later you discover these sorts of failures, the more expensive it gets to basically resolve them or to fix them. Like, if you would have discovered this like a year later, you know, then, well, you know, a lot of money has been spent. But in order to then tackle all these three tracks that we had set up, we decided to leverage some expertise. Now, the C++ code is obviously something where the expertise lays in-house. We have written our physics engine, we have written our graphics engine, we have written our audio engine, and the network stack, and uh, various other components that we have. And a lot of these systems have such arcane knowledge encoded in them that, you know, 
bringing other people into it to help us, difficult, would be the same amount of effort as just doing that work ourselves. But on the Python front, you know, Python 3 has been out for well over a decade, and there's many companies that help with like doing transitions from Python 2 to Python 3. We found really good partners in a company called Reckon Digital, and you know, they started helping us out, and we are very, very pleased with the results so far that we have seen. They, the, the guys have been blazing through the upgrade process. That's kind of impressive. And the other thing, or well, the last important thing to keep in mind for such complex projects is it's really difficult to put a time scale on it. Like you can't just say like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna put in the Python 3 interpreter, get our things to compile with it and run some scripts on a Python 2 code to convert it and it's gonna take me like six months. Nah, um, there are too many unknowns for, for these things to happen. And as such, we basically decided to set certain milestones that we wanted to reach. Again, the idea being fail early, fail fast. We have our game engine, something called the Python interpreter mode, where we can start it up like a Python shell. That was for us the first milestone where we would know if our integration of Python 3 would work. So we set that as the first milestone. The other two important milestones that we then had, because they're critical to running the game and getting it in your hands, is getting the server and the client up and running. Now we could have switched them around, but we opted for uh, the, the way of first getting the server up and running, simply because it requires less C++ components. And as we're running two of these three tracks that I outlined earlier in parallel, Rack and Digital doing the Python work while we are doing the C++ work, that means you know, we kind of can keep pace with them. And we get to re see results a bit quicker. And all of these complexities and realities then ended up in a, oh, that's the wrong slide, <laughs> sorry, ended then up in, in a situation like this. Um, this looks very, very busy in the graphic, but effectively we have the two tracks, right? On the top we have the Python track, and the bottom we have the Spessos track. This is actually from a stakeholder meeting we had a few weeks ago, so this is fairly up to date uh, with our progress on the project. And here you can see that in order to isolate our risks a bit more, we have certain check-in points. The Python code runs in a specific uh, the Python 2 to 3 transition runs in a, in a certain branch to begin with. Once we're happy with the results there, we get that into the main line of one, of one of our products. This is important because our test infrastructure may not necessarily cover all of the intrinsic, intrinsic details that the project has or that the game has, and this is then a point where we can figure out more of the critical parts. While, this is, while these things are going on, we happily chuck along and get our C++ components ready. Um, and at one point, they are kind of ready, right? And at that point, we can start getting the Python code, purely Python 3 as well, get them integrated, and end up with like hopefully something we can release at some point. Uh, but yeah, so these are the complexities that we sometimes have to deal with, and especially in the case of this Python 3 project that we have approached. Queen B is now going to tell you about another project we have recently been doing. That is right. So we had uh, somewhat different <coughs> challenge. And when I saw this image, it really resonated with me. It really f felt like it captured it well. It's uh, made by a Belgian uh, visual artist. His name is Philippe Dujardin. You can find him on Instagram. And he makes these fictional photographs of mostly architecturally impossible buildings. <coughs> and what we had uh, was this big monolithic, monolithic system that had been growing over the years and it held pretty much everything except the Eve server. So it had like the payment stuff, the accounts, the sign up, the CD keys, the buddy program, the, you know, what, all sorts of things that had uh, gathered over the years. We knew some of the pieces weren't needed, but we didn't really know what would happen if we took them out. And uh, like Apuria mentioned, we had, you know, people had come and gone. There was some lost knowledge there. And frankly, people were a bit scared to go in there because they didn't know where they would end up. So we knew we had to get out of that situation, like heading for the future. And at first, we thought we would just abandon that system and we would write a new one. It would be simple and beautiful and do everything we wanted. 
And of course, that was just an illusion. It was this, uh, we were fantasizing about a greenfield project. And by definition, that is a project where you start from scratch. You have no uh, legacy systems, no infrastructures, no dependencies, quite obviously not what we had. Um, and fortunately, we realized this quickly. We didn't spend a lot of time on it. I wanted to mention it, though, because this is so common. Um, it's so often when you have a complicated system, lost knowledge, technical debt, all these things, you think, oh, it'll be just be easier to write it from scratch. I've heard many stories like this. I'm sure you've, some of you are familiar with them as well. Um, it's almost never the answer, exactly because it's complicated. You don't know all the requirements. And the system is still in active development. It's going, the requirements are going to change as you are working. So, beware. Um, plan B, we would start cutting out the pieces that we knew we didn't need. We would figure out, you know, what was <coughs> needed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how we could cut them out. And then at the same time, we would improve uh, and uh, fix the things that we wanted to take forward towards the future. So we started acting on that. And uh, we did so mainly in uh, two ways. Uh, on one hand, we went in just deliberately removing components such as the body program that I, rem that I mentioned, which was the precursor to uh, today's recruitment system. And the recruitment system today is its own just separate independent service, but uh, the body program at the time was sort of a part of this big thing, and it had tentacles into other things. So even if it was no longer in use, it was still affecting the work that we were doing, we sometimes had to you know, work around it. There were tests, automated tests, that were ensuring that the buddy program still worked. So when we were making changes elsewhere, we sometimes had to you know, fix that. So just we went in with uh, components like this, removing them and like just digging deep, going, removing any dependencies then that were obsolete and so on. So just try to get some of these complications that were no longer relevant uh, out of the picture. And we sort of worked on this alongside other development work for a good stretch of time. At the same time, the other thing that we did was just to be always very mindful about being good citizens, about when we went in, we were doing development, we were fixing something or adding something, to make sure to leave the code better than it was when we came in. Like when you if you have to go in and you have to figure out and you have to spend time figuring out what's happening, try to leave it so that when the next person come or when you come in six months, that you don't have to go through that process again. And just as a practical, or just a very simple example of this, um, in the original implementation of a payment object, we had assumed we would be storing some credit card information. I think it was the last four digits and the CVC code. This never happened. We never stored this data. Um, but it was always a part of the payment. These properties were always there, and they were always being, you know, when you added something new that dealt with payments, you were always dealing with this, making sure to copy it along. And when a new programmer came in, and they would be like, what are we storing credit card information? I didn't know that. Is this needed for backwards compatibility, or why is this needed? And it's a small thing, um, but many small things add up to a lot of like just mental burden and confusion. Um, another just practical example, this is from a recent change. The code on the left was deleted in favor of that one green line on the right. And this is also an example of, yeah. <laughs> Isn't this fun? Uh, the code on the left is also a good example, I think, of how this technical debt grows. Somebody comes in, they need to add some logic, and they don't want to touch the other logic because it probably needs to be there. So I'll just squeeze my thing in there. So rather than do that, uh, the developer in question spent some time making sure, you know, that this was safe, this could be done and simplified, and then went ahead with this change. If you were a developer, you might be thinking, I hope you're thinking, well, didn't you have tests? Why did you have to spend even time, you know, validating this? Very true, and tests are super important, automated tests. Um, thankfully, and this helped us actually a lot, uh, somewhat surprisingly for such old code, it actually, most of the system had pretty decent test coverage, and that often helped us. At the same time, tests are, of course, themselves human constructs. They fall prey to the same, you know, 
uh, processes of decay over time. And they, they're testing obsolete, like the body system that I mentioned, they're just testing obsolete functionality. They also tend to uh, be even, become more difficult to read than the code itself. So we've also put some effort into making the tests more uniform and easier to read, so they're easier to work with. Um, so we worked on like this for a good stretch of time. Um, eventually, we came to a point where we were trying to move to a new platform. We were making some new code paths. There were parts of the system that we were you know, planning to leave behind, but we couldn't quite do it yet. And so we, it had started to become overly complicated to sort of maintain backwards compatibility while trying to go towards the future. So at that point, we came up with a new plan which was to uh, make copies of the logic that we wanted to modify and take uh, forward and so that we could leave the backwards compatibility in a separate copy of the same code. And this is like, the blue is the, um, the old bit, where you see blue and purple is where we made copies and then the purple is the new, new pieces. This is from an actual like, design document or we were trying to like, wrap our heads around what we, were, what we had on our hands. We, this decision was taken after careful deliberation. It would have been a terrible idea to do this in the beginning because when we did this, we had two copies of the same logic. And it did mean in some cases we had to make changes, the same change in two places. So if we had started out doing this, it would have been a lot of extra work and just a uh, mental burden to keep track of what we were doing, what we had done. Um, but at that time, we had made enough progress. We knew the code well enough. Uh, and we could see the finish line. We knew this would be for a limited amount of time that we would have to do the uh, duplicate changes. Um, so this is where we are now. Uh, our kitchen is a lot, lot cleaner. We still have this mess in the corner there, which uh, meaning that uh, we still have one piece of functionality that um, still goes through the old bits, the uh, blue boxes there. Uh, the replacement for that is actually in testing right now, so we foresee we can cut this away within like a few weeks at most. When that happens, we can delete the last pieces of those blue boxes, and at that point we will have deleted around one million lines of code, so that will be a happy day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that means, uh, that uh, includes simplifications like you saw before, um, maybe not very, that there isn't a big chunk of the num that number, um, components that are no longer relevant. Uh, um, and also, like this Piaporia mentioned uh, with Python 3 projects, sometimes when we have newer frameworks, newer packages and so on, we just, we can do things in a simpler way. We need less overhead, we need less customizations and modifications. Um, so it's uh, a lot uh, nicer, easier and faster to work in that code now. And for you, the players, that just very simply means we can do more and a better setup for the future. Uh, we started out heading somewhere. Uh, we had a rough idea how we were gonna get there. Um, this has been a journey. We have taken many long conversations in the team. It's very much been a team effort, uh, deliberating what are, are we still heading in the right direction? How can we, and we've had to backtrack and all that. But it's been very rewarding, and especially now where we feel we're really starting to, you know, feel the benefits of this. Back to you, Puria. Speaking of journeys, these upgrade projects are always journeys. And these journeys look different. Depending upon the path that we have to take, there are different risks that we have to deal with. Like ascending Everest. You can try to go the straight line up, or you can start here, and then you realize, oh, you need to change path. The Python 3 project was just more line of this. Well, we just can go one way. There's a lot of risk to get up there, but we have to do it. We need to prepare well so that we don't fail on our journey. The payments team had a similar goal, but they had the luxury to deviate a little bit on their path. They could start here and then realize, oh, this path doesn't go forward. Let's try this one over there. And that's how they achieved it. So one of the first learnings from these up upgrade projects for CCP is 
that different upgrade projects have different requirements and they may need to be approached slightly different. But what else can we learn from these things? One of the biggest learnings, certainly, and it's probably for every company in the world, and it's obvious in hindsight always, is that tribal knowledge will be a roadblock. Quite literally, as in this picture. Maybe some of you know that picture. When you Google for Chesterton's fence, this is the, one of the results that will come up. What is Chesterton's fence? That is essentially what tribal, uh, the, the philosoph philosophical example for tribal knowledge. You see a fence that's going across the road. It's in your way, but can you remove the fence? Why is it there? What's the purpose? No one knows, except for the people that put it up, right? There's no sign here that says, like, don't remove the fence, or there's no note here that says, like, oh, you know, we put this fence up because the neighbor's sheep are roaming freely and we need to keep them away from this part of the road. Nothing. So it's a very, very difficult situation to be in. This is something we are facing a lot. And we have taken measures internally to combat this tribal knowledge, to have less of a roadblock when we do upgrade projects. These things include code comments, commit messages, and architecture decision records. They serve different purposes. The commit messages and code comments are definitely very close to the code, so they hopefully describe why the code was changed in a way. Nobody used to tell me this iterates 10 times over something, rather tell me why you're iterating 10 times over the thing. And in the case of architecture decision records, it's like just saying I put up this fence because the neighbor's horses were feeding on my lawn. Another thing is that these upgrade projects we have to do is a great opportunity to pay down technical debt that we have. You can never really justify technical debt projects in isolation. There are many programmers which say like, oh, you know, I would like to just spend two weeks sitting there fixing all these things in the design that I just like skimmed over when I, do it, when I was doing the, the initial product. But when you, then bring, when you then bring this kind of suggestion to your production team, it's like, well, but uh, you know, what kind of value are we producing those two weeks? And it's really difficult to just say like, well, this is value for us developers. Like there needs to be actually business value being created so that you know, production will get, give you the buy-in for making this change. That's a lot easier when you have a project that's critical, like Python 3 update or the payment system update. Then you can say like, hey, we're gonna get this new payment system out of the door, which gives us this benefit on top of it. And at the same time, we can make it easier for the future. Again. <laughs> yeah. So the next learning is that it's really important to invest in observability and testing infrastructure for the software. Without observability, we don't know what's going on at runtime. You know, we can have all our nice little demos and examples within our projects as they are, but we don't know how it actually behaves on tranquility. You know, when suddenly 8,000 of you jump into a system to fight each other, it's like, well, hmm, what's actually happening? You know, like this was not supposed to happen like this. But um, to be able to deal with those situations and to draw proper conclusions, you need observability. The other part is then the testing aspect where without a good test suit, it's basically impossible to go ahead and exercise all the functionality in your project. EVE is a super complex game, as we all know, and I think the regression test suit takes several days if run by a human. So you don't want to spend that kind of time for every tiny change you make or for every upgrade project you make constantly. So investing into the test coverage is really important there as well. Oh, and it works again. And um, last but not least, maintenance work is like tending your garden or cleaning the kitchen, as we had furthermore. But if you want to have a garden that's as beautiful as this one, right? Everything neatly arranged, grass evenly cut, nice arrangement of flowers. If you want something like that, you need to put in a lot of work. Imagine you would leave this for like two seasons without any attendance. There would be things growing all over, right? So it's a constant effort you have to put in. If you don't put in the effort, you don't get a good product. That's as simple as it is. And with all these learnings, 
This is how we tend to keep EVE running forever. Thank you. I think we have just a few minutes for questions if you, if you have any, yes? So, so thanks for the talk. Uh, there's a common meme amongst these players around pod code. Is there any kind of reality to that specific area of the code base, or is that just a joke? Can you repeat so meme? Yeah, Do you, are you familiar with this, Thomas? Uh, 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 the question is if there's any truth to memes about POS code. I've, I haven't been in I, the EVE code I'm going for so to long. The fifth. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think that's best. Yes, please. So the question is about the no downtime experiment that we ran last year. Um, there has been a little progress on that front since last year. We are still aiming for it. And we have picked off the easy low hanging fruits. But there are some things that take a bit more effort and they are currently being investigated. It's similar to the Python 3 update, right? It's a very critical thing. and. Uh, so it takes very careful planning, but it's definitely still on the table. Could you speak towards the test server availability? I know that uh, there were some, some comments about how it was only going to be brought online for specific tests, uh, as opposed to being online all the time. But um, it's helpful in the absence of documentation to be able to, to go poke at things from time to time. So the question is about the availability of test servers and whether certain things are constantly available on them or not. We are running many, many different test servers inter internally. And we do provide test servers for dedicated purposes. <coughs> like, for example, the native Mac client, way before it was able to, to be put into the main line where it would eventually be released, we already wanted to gain confidence. So we set up a test server environment where we connect with the native Mac client to that. Um, so they may not always be available to the public, but we definitely have a lot of those internally and we provide them as needed. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, do you feel pretty confident in 20 years that you'll be able to upgrade to like the next big version of Python we might have, like four? And if, so, <laughs> <laughs> if so, what do you think the biggest like lesson learned is throughout the next kind of year about so the question is whether, when we look back in 20 years and the next big major Python upgrade comes along, whether we would look back and say like, hey, yeah, this is going to be easy or not. Um, this is a really good question. Like it depends a lot on what will be happening in those 20 years, right? It depends a lot on the changes that, that are coming. Um, one thing from the current learnings that we have and that we, are that we have prepared for such future updates is that we are very diligent on how we keep track of the modifications we are making to Python. Like with Python 2, it's all in the Python 2 code base itself, littered over it, as I said earlier, like, some of, like most of it annotated, not everything. Um, but that makes it really difficult uh, that when you just take the new version, uh, any new version of Python really, right? We were on 2.7.1, if we would go to 2.7.2 already, it's, it's really difficult to judge what is a genuine change in Python? And what is the thing that we modified that needs to be adapted? We have found a solution for that internally where we basically just get the normal sources of stackless Python and then just have a set of patch files, all individually containing functionality that we need that then gets successively applied on the original sources. So when we then take a new version of Python and there is a change that affects our, um, our modifications, then that specific patch is gonna fail to apply and we know exactly what we have to look at. So it should definitely make a lot of things easier going forward. Yeah. And maybe then to pick up from that uh, on a slightly different note, or like how, what we think will happen in the next 20 years and where we will be then. So all our efforts now, you may have heard about the Quasar platform. So we're very much working towards what we think will help us to going forward to reduce, these, reduce the scope of these big changes 
making when we make additions to make them in, in uh, isolated services that are more manageable as units rather than and this is as you know how uh, uh, where the trend has been going in the recent years um, from the big monoliths that we uh, used to build to these little components that are more controllable also like uh, Apuria mentioned earlier uh, uh, observability and automated tests and these things that sort of help us to keep things in a good shape and make it easier to uh, take them forward. There's a question. That's the last question that we can take, back. sorry. Yeah. So I think the question was, uh, like, do we have... Yeah, you have a better way of documenting? Yeah. Yes, I mean, we have, I mean, the, the company and all the development practices obviously have, like, learned a lot and matured a lot over the years. The question is, are we documenting better what we do? And I think uh, Apurya's example of, of how we commit, uh, how we document our commits, it's a very good example. This was one of the first things that I learned when I joined CCP. Was when you commit, like, just short description, link to the work item, and why are you doing it? Don't tell me, you know, add it, I don't know, add it an if statement. I can see that. That's not helpful. Why did you do it? Um, and just the paper trail, like, link to the work item. So that, uh, and this happens, we uh, sometimes go back you know, 10 years, why was this change made? So we have learned a lot, we're doing a lot better definitely from the early days. And if you worked for a startup, you also know like, it's just different requirements. When you're getting started and you just want to get something out the door, you, that's a different mindset and you're in a different sort of, there are different things that are more important then. And then, then you need to settle into sort of a more disciplined production cadence. And uh, that's definitely, for, like, from having been with CCP since 2007, definitely see a lot of uh, maturity in, in that. All right. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>